Okay, so we're 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 back. We're live. Let's see if um see if this will work. Um, we good to continue, Callum? Um, yes, you're fine now. Brilliant. Okay. Fantastic. Okay, so um, just picking up from where we um where we where we left off there. So we're talking a little bit about the fly fishing business, and and you you yeah. mentioned how part of the um part of the grant was was essentially training and coaching uh through through business you were set up a, 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 i suppose a business hub so it would have been a collection of offices which were there specifically for businesses to 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 rent and to um and, and to, to 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 locate themselves at and i think that's where we got to so i'll just let you okay. continue from there please yeah so the business the business hub was called uh, sunderland enterprise center so that was a uh, uh, it was it was sponsored by the, the Prince's Trust and also Box Breweries, Whitbread, Marks and Spencers, a lot of big capital businesses, uh, and a lot of big local businesses too. And they put money in in the form of investment so that the business owners could have uh, cheap rent. And 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 we're going back to probably 1986, 1987. Mm. So the rent at that time was like 25 to 30 pound a month, and that included everything you know that was your mm. um they, they actually had a pool downstairs which which has secretaries in photocopies and stuff like that so you could take your photocopying down you could take letters down to be typed up um and that was all your electricity and everything so the initial first start from us was to produce a catalog and a range of a range of stuff that we were going to sell get a whole a wholesale or a supplier and then produce these catalogs and then um advertise through um magazines fishing magazines newspapers uh, and that's where we started to build our customer base from. But those days, it was like there was no email, there was no, uh, you know, internet. Mm. It was ring us, leave a message, and we'll send you out a catalog in the post. And then orders were delivered. And normally, your order would take about five to seven days to go out to the client. And they would pay you by check. So you had that, you know, mm. quite often. Delay. If you didn't have a check, check guarantee card, sometimes the orders would bounce, you know, and you didn't mm. have any comeback on it. Mm -hmm. So, so initially then it's it's a mail order business um and and how did it progress then so say within the first three to six months did you see a sudden spike in orders was there a reason for that had you put adverts into local papers for for example kids out there you'll, you, you don't you probably don't know what we're talking about you know ads yeah. in papers what's going on here um and and then leading on from that at what point and then what kind of um initiated you to look towards a walk-in store so we, uh, yeah, so, so that, that time at the enterprise center was limited. So we knew there would only ever be two to three years there. Uh, we got to actually about three and a half years stage and they were like, come on, you got to go now. We, we got to move on. Mm -hmm. Even though it wasn't full, it had 40 units. And I think there was only about, you know, 15, 20 of the units actually fully used, but mm -hmm. it was initially to get you off the ground and get you going. And we also wanted the walk-in trade because it, obviously the, the mail order side was good, but the, the walk-in trade would be even better. Mm -hmm. um, so that was, you know, as we grew and we made money from the business, uh, we started a wholesale side so we could supply other fishing shops and angling clubs. Mm -hmm. And then we looked at getting premises uh, so we could so we could have the passing trade element as well. So where did you, um, where was the shop then? How big was it? Did, did you? Did you spend a bit of time looking into it or did you just basically walk the streets and, and see what you can find, you, you know, with the budget that you had in mind? And, and uh, I'm also interested into the, the amount of stock that you would hold. So when you had a mail order business, I, I, you, were you drop shipping? So that means an order comes in and a company sends it out for you and, and they get their payment. You, you know, you take your percentage. Did you buy stock in for the mail order business? And then, as I said, leading on from that, moving into a walk-in store, did you did you have to put a lot of, of resources and financial resources into holding a lot of stock? Yeah, we did have a fair bit of stock, um, and I think that was probably eventually the downfall of the of the business because mm. um, the premises we bought were we, we we couldn't afford you know town centre premises, um, so we looked at you know the suburbs of the town um, areas that did have a high street, um, you know with with passing. Pr passing trade and sort of like adequate parking and stuff like that but um one of the i mean most of these sort of like high street areas are now went nowhere busy as they used to be like mm. 30 years ago you know on the, mm. the outskirts of the towns um and it, so we, we kept stock yet yeah, but unfortunately one of the big things we found um was uh that saleable uh, fishing tackle is very saleable 
um, for for thieves, you know. So if somebody breaks mm. into the the shop, it's dead easy to sell. They just had to go down to the beach and sell it to people who were fishing on the beach, mm-hmm. and and that was ultimately the downfall of the business because we ended up having about uh, seven break-ins in in three years, mm. uh, and we couldn't get insurance anymore. So that would that became the end of that particular business um, because we had to have stock because it was a shop. And people could actually physically see the see the the, the stock in the shop. It was easy mm-hmm. for them to to eye it up and. And um, and then you know when we went there, break into the shop and take the stuff. So the um by by the you know the 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 third or fourth break in, are you saying that that you realised that it wasn't going to work that business model or that type of business what wasn't going to work and and when you decided to come out of that, had it been a, a success for you both personally and financially, and and what would you say you learned from that? I learned a lot from it because obviously starting a business that's 17 year old, there was a lot of people who wanted to take advantage of us financially, you know, so we did make quite a lot of mistakes, but I mean, every mistake you make, um, you, you don't do that mistake again. It, it brought it, out, it brought a bit of confidence out because we, 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 you know, we were very young kids when we started up and then we finished the business. I was like, uh, 25. So financially, mm. uh, we'd made some money, but pretty much everything that I'd made by the time I was 25, I'd pretty much lost anyway, because the last two break-ins were uninsured. And, and unfortunately, the very last break-in, uh, they, they, there wasn't much stuff stolen, but they caused more damage than than, than stuff that was stolen, a lot more damage, uh, which we had to repair and then come out the come out the building and, and walk away from the building and hand back the keys to the landlord. But, you know, we had a lot of experience from it. And a lot of that experience I used later on in life when I set up my business after I left the military. Well, well, that's the next question. So if I'm right in understanding, when, we, when you'd moved away from that business, you, you know, it had been a success in some, in, 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 uh, in some aspects, perhaps not so much, or, or let's just say perhaps a failure in some other aspects. Now, I believe after that you went to go and work for, you know, electronics company, that didn't work out too well perhaps yeah i don't want to speak for you but perhaps you you know you you felt as if if you're going to do something it would be for yourself and then from there you then signed up to the military so could you tell us a little bit about why you chose what does why why you took that decision to sign up who you signed up for and your experience uh, in, in the service that you had so um Oh, that you gave. It's funny after 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 being uh, after being your know, sixteen, seventeen year old, being self employed for maybe the first working part of my life up to twenty five, and then I went to join uh, to work for um, High Street Electrical Retailers Dixons uh, because I did like photography and photography was one of my my, my hobbies, and um, I thought yeah, it'd be great selling cameras. I didn't like the idea of being told what to do. Mm. Um, and I didn't like the idea of of somebody wanting me to be as passionate about their business as I had been about my own. Because mm. you know Dixon's wasn't my business. I was just selling cameras to people. So I didn't. I didn't last too long there. I lasted maybe about a year and a half, and then I came out. And um, I didn't actually have any ideas to join the military. Funny enough, I went to Newcastle to buy a shirt, and mm. it was the day I went to buy a shirt. I walked past the Navy careers, and I saw a picture of um, a chef, uh, a sailor in a chef's uniform on the on the careers office. And I just walked in and says, "How do you go about joining the Navy?" because I loved cooking. Uh, so I decided I wanted to be a Navy chef. They told us that uh, they weren't actually recruiting chefs at the time, but I could sign up and become an aircraft engineer, um, which sounded really impressive. Um, so I was, that was it there. And then on the, on the, on that day, I signed on the dotted, uh, dotted line for 22 years, I got accepted. And um, literally about five months after that, I was, uh, I went off to uh, HMS Rally to start my basic training. So you joined, you joined the Navy. Yeah. That's right. Yeah, fantastic. And um, so, so what, what, what branch did you did you then did you you signed up to to go into what 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 area of the navy did you did you serve in? So, so I, I served with the the fleet air arm. So that's the aircraft side of the navy, and uh, I signed up as a as an engineer, like an aircraft engineer. Mm. Um, I've never been good with engineering, never been good with uh, mechanics or anything like that. But that at, at the time, I think that's all they were taking on because they, they had like recruitment gaps to fill. So I, so I joined as an engineer, did uh, three years, four years as an engineer. And then that gave me a choice to apply to be 
uh, a photographer because photographers in the Navy oh, are, what right. called, yes. uh, are what's called sideroads entry branch. So you can't join as one. You, you've got to have a rank called a rank mm. and, and, and do so many years service before you can apply to be one. So so then I applied to uh, to be a photographer. And at the time, being a photographer was also connected with the intelligence services as well. So I had to have all my vetting and um, and um development vetting and, and, and intelligence checks before I could actually go through to be a photographer. So um got the application that that uh, was successful and then it was off to um the military school of photography for six months to learn how to be a professional military photographer. Now I want to ask you about that. It's interesting. Um so <laughs> There's different ways to let's let's pick three broad categories of how to, and I'm no expert so correct me if I'm wrong to become a photographer a professional photographer or even a, an amateur photographer number one trial and error you just buy a camera you go out and, and film stuff and take pictures yeah. number two you go to college or university and you you, you attain a de- degree or some form of qualification in photography um, or C you join the military and become a, 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 a in this your case a naval photographer so. So how did that work then? So you had six months. What were they teaching? I mean, were they teaching you setups? Were they teaching you about the camera? Um, were they teaching you, you know, how to uh, compose a, a picture, which I know something about? Yeah. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and, 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 and aside from that, what differences do you believe there would be between learning it on your own and more specifically learning it, say, at college or university compared to learning it through the military? So obviously, uh, you know, as with learning it on your own, uh, you know, you've got that creative element. So, so the military do give you guidances to train you on the basics of photography, which is, you know, your exposure, your composition, you know, how to use the camera. We, even back in those days, we were, for the first eight weeks, it was all basic. So it was, it was using a Hasselblad camera, which with a handheld light meter, photographing in black and white and then hand developing because what they wanted us to do, even though digital was around and, and we were using digital, they wanted us to get into the habit of taking the picture as we see it and not with the idea of oh, I'll Photoshop it out later. Mm. So, um, you know, get it right in the camera. And also as well, you know, to to not rely too heavily on your kit to be able to guess what your exposure is going to be just by looking at the sky, just by telling what the clouds are like, you know, to get a, a rough idea of the light reading. So, 26 weeks with 26 exams, uh, three strikes and you're out. So if you failed three times, you'd be kicked off course and sent, sent back to your to your, your previous unit. Um, as with everything with the military, they just chuck you in, you know, they chuck you in at the deep end and, and really sort of plow you through. Now, if you go to um, university and you do a Bachelor uh, of Arts Honours degree in photography, which takes you th- three years, um, at the end of it, if you want to uh, get your license set from the British Institute of Professional Photographers, you have to submit 12 mounted images to go before a judging panel. And they will then assess that and decide whether you can be accredited. If you do your Navy or Army qualification, the 26 weeks, um, they will automatically give you your, your grading for the British Institute of Professional Photographers because they, they say that the military level is high enough standard mm. that they don't have to, to check it again, so to speak. Um, and then after those 26 weeks, after I'd done those 26 weeks, I was sent up to Scotland for my first job, um, my first draft. And that and basically it was three weeks shadowing another photographer mm-hmm. um, seeing what he did. Then the boss checking my work. And then the, at the end of the three weeks, he says, right, that's it, Jeff, you, you're on your own. You can go out and do your do jobs on your own. He says, yeah, go home this weekend, uh, have a relax and then come back Monday. He says, because your first job, you will be uh, photographer for prince philip so that is <laughs> the first job no I had pressure then myself. yeah uh, typical military isn't it so uh it was yeah prince philip's photographer at uh, speenbridge and the the northwest coast of scotland for the uh, commando memorial remembrance parade so how did you prepare for that then you've been told okay you're going you're going to be the official photographer uh for, for royalty and um, not much margin for error error i wouldn't have thought so I mean, how did you feel about that, and, and how do you think that benefited you, and and um, and, and how did your preparation, uh, um, how did your preparation, um, take care of itself? How did you take care of that for that particular um, that particular job? 
But I think it's just like anything, you know, you sort of you go back to the training that you've had and, and um, a lot of it, you know, I, I think a lot of any any photography, whether you're doing because I went on to do quite a few royal jobs and high key jobs, um, high profile jobs. But I think with everything, it, it's um, prior planning, you know, and also doing a really good recce of where you're going to be. So it, getting as much information as you can tell mm. um, and, and looking over the area, because one of the biggest things about photography is, um, you know, it's. A lot of it is is being able to capture, being in the right position at the right time. But obviously, if you want that, if you want that thrill, if you want that extra oomph to your images, it's about knowing where to be to get the best image. You know, um, and 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 this particular place, Spain Bridge, had a, a fantastic backdrop of some amazing mountains. You know, so you wanted to make sure you were positioned at an angle as the the sun was rising with the with the mountains in the background. So it's all about knowing the. The, the the geography and the areas and being in the best areas to so so when he did come along and you were doing the pictures you you had a fantastic background other other otherwise it would just be a snap you know you mm. were trying to compose a, an image and this was bef- way before the days of you know mobile phones and and, and snapping an image and and yeah. snapping many yeah. images and, and then picking the, the best of those I, I want to ask you next um about your then transition into the intelligence side uh, within the, the the navy but just before we do that i'd like to um introduce our next sponsor for tonight's podcast we'd like to thank all of our sponsors tonight um our sponsor is skyline loft conversion skyline is a high-end loft loft conversion company who have over 30 years experience in this industry with over 900 jobs completed as far all to the most exclusive and highest possible standards. The company is a family-run business located in the northeast of England. From simple loft conversions to custom-built fitted wardrobes, they have always prepared to serve the customer to their specific needs. Needs, not knees. No need to look elsewhere. The sky truly is the limit. You can contact them on Facebook. Simply type in Skyline Loft Conversions. And you can also find them on Instagram, at Skyline Loft Conversion. So we were just talking a little bit there about um, your uh, training and your first um, your first job as a as a as a military photographer, a naval photographer. But then you transitioned into the intelligence side. So how did that take place? So basically, after after um, after, after a while being a photographer um, and numerous photography jobs, they, um, like like everything in the military, you know, you get settle somewhere but eventually you know you're going to move on and you're going to get another draft elsewhere to do something else and they've had a few other drafts a few of the jobs in mind and then um lo and behold the boss comes up and says look we you're not going to get that draft you want to go for you're going to get this one instead um so it was to work with the uh, as an image analysis for uh, the intelligence um basically with the intelligence services and um first of all i'd have to be sent off to do my intelligence course which was um six month another six month training mm. course uh down at a place called army chick sands which is near bedfordshire uh to do that training course and then that progressed on to working at a place called jarrick which uh was um in uh, in cambridge which uh, so that was basically aerial surveillance aerial uh imagery from satellite from uh aircraft and um the the, the idea was that because we were photographers and, and we had an eye for for imagery we had an eye for detail we'd be good at spotting stuff um, from satellite and spotting stuff from aerial imagery that other people probably potentially couldn't see. So what did you, what did you enjoy most about that job? I mean, what, what I would say, what was the, not specifics obviously, but what was a highlight of that particular field and what would you say was a low point, not as necessarily a moment, but an overall arc of, of working in that specific field? So the, so the job was really interesting, you know, and it, and it gave you an insight into like the sort of James Bondy sort of world of, of, of intelligence and, mm. and what goes on and all the different agencies that support that, you know, because you've got MI6 and, and then you've got GCHQ, which is the listening side of things. So you've got the imagery, the listening side, you've got the, the agents on the ground. Um, so to, to understand stuff that obviously is very James Bondy and, 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 and obviously very secretive is really interesting. But for me, one of the, one of the downsides of it, you know, a lot of the work was uh, in underground uh, secret bunkers. Um, sometimes in the winter you'd go to work and it was dark and you'd come out of work and it was dark and you hadn't seen any daylight because you'd been in a bunker. Mm. And 
as a photographer, you know, when you were a photographer, you were going everywhere. You were, you were on ships, you were in helicopters, you were on speedboats, you know, you, you, you're meeting different people. And then to be sort of like um, taken away into sort of like, you know, offices with no light and, and stuff, it, it didn't really have that appeal to me. So I did that for, for two, I think it was about two, two and a half years. But during that time, um, I was starting to do the, the odd job, the odd portrait, the odd wedding. And it also met another photographer down there who was from Sunderland, and we decided we were going to come out and set up a photography business. Tell us about that, please. Transition straight into that. Yeah, so um, so we started we started doing jobs on weekends, and then I said to Kev, I says, look, I says, if we, if we start taking these wedding bookings, and then all of a sudden something happens, a war kicks off, or, or we both get drafted, then we're going to we're going to be leaving a lot of rides in the lurch. I said, so at least one of us needs to come out. So at the time, I wasn't married, Kev was. And Kev had two kids. So I says, look, I'll, I'll put my notice in first. I'll come out first. And then if the business becomes a success, then he could follow. So I put my notice on and uh, put my notice in and then eventually came out. But when you, when you leave the military, um, you get about £7,500 to spend on courses, which is called your resettlement money back into being a civilian. So I thought that I was adequately... Um, provided for in, in, in the photographic side of things. But what I needed to do was learn how to market a business and brand a business. Mm. So I spent all my money on uh, the marketing and branding, which had a, a massive effect on the business because we went from just opening one business to eventually opening five different photography businesses. Wow, I didn't know any of this. Mm. So, um, yeah, so basically after about six or eight months, um, there was enough income coming in for, for, for Kev to leave his job and then he left his job. He left his uh, job as a military photographer. And then when he came out, that is when we could start expanding and we, we started taking people on. We had photographers working for us. And we, we started with the wedding business. Then we we um, started the um, uh, nursery school business and eventually had 65 nursery schools on our books. You know, we, did, uh, we were doing about 80 to 90 weddings a year. And then we opened the uh, commercial photography business and then there was the boudoir makeover studio, which was doing about a thousand uh, lingerie makeovers a year as well. And then at that time, I looked into developing a, a, a photography training program to teach other photographers how to market their business. Mm. That's. Can you talk a little bit about the, just how you managed to bring all those separate parts of the business together and, and keep them under, I don't want to say under control, but under um or observation, pun to the intelligence side there, but but just manage to structure those budget, those those separate businesses, and 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 uh, and manage them correctly and uh, effectively and efficiently, um, and 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 well, yeah. So can you talk a little well, bit one, about one, that? One of the one of the first things I learned when I did this, um, you know, did did my training in marketing and branding was that um, one of the best ways to be a success is to specialize. Because if you become a jack of all trades, if you try and do everything, and um, then you don't become special to everybody. And if, if, you, if you try and appeal to everybody, you become special to no one. And the only thing that can make you different is to lower your prices. You know? mm. So what you do is you create individual businesses for each individual niche. And, and even more so now, you know, now where people, you know, back, back then, you would have a choice of maybe you know, you go for like a Mercedes C-Class and there might be four or five different types of C-Class. Now there's something like 90 different types of C-Class because mm -hmm. people want more choice. People mm -hmm. want individual things. You know, people will go, you know, back then people would go to cafes. Now people go to coffee shops to mm -hmm. have coffee and have 20 different types of coffee instead mm -hmm. of just an instant coffee, you know, <laughs> and a percolated coffee, you know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So so now it's, it, so that that's, that's what got us started on Tunisian. So we created different brands for each different business. Because obviously the commercial side of the business was a much more sort of because we, we dealt in a lot of construction photography, the website, the branding, the colors, it, it had a very masculine appeal to it. And what we were selling was a solution to a need. So the, the need was that the company needed to make more money. They needed to show their portfolio. They needed to, do, to grow their brand and, and um, you know, their, their prestige online. Now, when you think about boudoir, you think about weddings, that isn't a solution to a problem that is an emotional um, purchase. So people are buying it for an emotional reason. And both boudoir and wedding photography, you know, the wording's a lot more softer. It has that feminine touch to it. It's different colors, it's different words, it's different writing. So it's impossible to put everything 
onto one website and mm-hmm. have one social me- social media page because if you did that and then you started posting images of weddings and started posting images of lingerie then the next week you started posting pictures of trucks and construction Your customers you're gonna yeah. yeah you're gonna turn all the brides off and turn all the women who wanted lingerie shoots off you know so mm. you've got to you've got to separate your niches out separate your businesses out and and serve your customers better and when you become a perfect fit for your client that's when you can charge a lot more for your for your services that's brilliant so so what happened with that business did, did you um did you decide to wrap that business up or, or did you sell the business and and then and then what did you then move on to after that? How did you, and did you have to so, connect dots or was it something completely new? Uh, so, so basically the, uh, we moth, I, I, I created and developed the, the photography training business, which I then mothballed um, because we were just too busy doing everything else. But the concept was still there. I set the business up and I set the, the training program up. The wedding business, it continued to run and it's still running now, but it's, that's going to finish this year and I'm, I'm not doing any more weddings. The uh, the nursery school business, my ex business partner is still running. He still he still kept going. The commercial side we, we closed down in the studio. We sold all the studio stuff off and, and and closed the studio because at that time I was going through a divorce and uh, the studio um, I needed to move house. I needed to sell the studio and then but at that at that time I decided um, that I would fulfil a dream of always buying of always wanting to own a food pub, like a proper country food pub. Mm. So I invested probably somewhere in the region of about 180,000 altogether. And how long uh, ago was this? Just, just so we can kind of two, adjust for 2000, inflation. 2014. Right. So, so it's, it's, it's what, seven, seven years ago. So it's, it's yeah, still a, yeah. a hefty whack, I would say. Well, pretty much everything I had, like my entire sort of like life, life savings that I had available um, and money from the sale of the house. I, I invested in opening a, a food pub, which was my dream. And it was a proper food pub. You know, it was a lovely country pub. It had like uh, two log fires. Uh, it was quite big. So the idea was we were going to do wedding venues, uh, wedding events there as well. But to cut a long story short, everything that could possibly go wrong with that business did go wrong. Mm. And I, I just never felt I was in the right fit because I was in a, a country village that I wasn't from. I didn't think I fit in really well. A lot of people were saying, oh, you're not from the area, you're from outside the area. It was one of those sort of things, mm-hmm, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, and after 12 months to save myself driving a car off a, off a bridge, mm. um, I had to come out. Yeah, I had mm. to come out. So, so I came out and um, and lost everything, lost all the money I'd put in um, with an additional sort of £60,000 worth of debt on top of that. Mm-hmm. And decided to run away to Northumberland, which is where I am now. And came up here, had a reset of my life. Uh, went through probably about six months of quite severe depression. Uh, I spent a lot of time listening to audio books, reading books on on self development, um, positivity, mindset, that sort of stuff, and and really got myself in a, into a better place um, to restart off this uh, this this new sort of online teaching business, which is what I do now. You know, so what what did what what did that so so. <coughs> You started a business which, and again, just correct me if I'm wrong on any of this. So you started a business, the the pub specifically, the country pub, because you had this, I imagine, this idea or this 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 vision of what it would be like and what it could be like. Yeah. But then when you went into that and it became a reality, the reality didn't match up with the uh, with the vision. Now, two things. Do you think that was because just happenstance perhaps fate um uh well, that, 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 that it didn't I, match I think, the vision I, or I do you think it just um, wasn't meant to be well i think it, it, a couple of things you know because um we all got you know if, if you're somebody who's a bit of a foodie and you love a country pub you know it is it is nice from the other side from from the other side of the bar it, it's very attractive it looks like the ideal life you know and you oh, you, you know if you're ever hungry you just got good food around you and desserts and stuff like that all the time and you're in beautiful surroundings and you you're never lonely you've got people around you but when you when you put it onto the other side you know there's a lot of stress there's a lot of pressure the margins aren't that fantastic in 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 in, the, in especially if it's a, a tenanted pub you know if it's owned by the brewery mm-hmm. the margins certainly aren't fat- fantastic on the beer side of things um staffing is a nightmare you know we had 21 staff it was mm, um it's a lot. <laughs> 
yeah, yeah. So there's it's so much comes into it, you know, and it is very stressful. Yeah. You never get a time to to be away from it. Um, and it, and it was a case if I had to get out. If I didn't get out, I was going to do something really stupid. Mm. And, and and if I hadn't got out, if I think I'd gone another three or four months, I wouldn't be here. Mm. Uh, but I look back at that um, that particular time as is the biggest failure in one of the in pro, you know the darkest time of my life for about three or six months. But that's probably the best thing that ever happened to me because that led that led to a complete turnaround in my uh, my mindset, a complete turnaround in my way of thinking, everything that was important to me. Um, and then to create a business that was built around, um, you know, the flexibility of life, an entire online business where, you know, people book in with me up to two weeks in advance and that's it. So anything, you know, like three weeks or four weeks from now, I can decide what I'm doing. I'm not, mm. you know, my, my hours are very flexible. Some days I start at five in the morning. Some days I work till 10 o'clock at night, depending on I've got clients in 20 different countries around the world. Mm-hmm. But, you know, there's there's no overheads there's no cost of buying anything and selling anything um i have freelancers who work for me in 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 different areas but you know the business this business is my own i don't have any staff i don't have any overheads um and i've just grown it and grown it and grown it over the past five years we're going we're going to come on to that because obviously that that's very important for the listeners and uh, the, what you're doing right now obviously it's important to you what the business that you've built and the different aspects of that business. I mentioned the show wrap. I mentioned that you, you you write as well, that you have some very, some very successful books, um, which we'll talk about. Before we do, um, I also know that um, you're a very um, strong uh, individual. I know that you, you work out. I know that you're you, you're an endurance athlete in a sense. You, you, you walk, you hike. Um, that's something that you're very passionate about. Um, I also know that you train in power kickboxing too. That's something that you study for for enjoyment and for fitness. Um, and uh, and I've and I've been with you on one of these infamous long um, hikes, walks, which um, I just remember. Uh, it was almost like going on a walk with uh, um, uh, Jason from Friday the Thirteenth because you just didn't stop. You would just keep going and keep going and keep going. Um, so, so can you just talk a little bit about that, about your outdoor pursuits, about, about, um, you know, the, the training side of what you do, the physical side of what you do and, and what you enjoy from that and, and, and not so much what that's taught you, but what that in a sense does for you physically, emotionally, and perhaps even, uh, spiritually. Um, I just love, I love being outdoors. I love the outdoors. I've always, I've always loved the country, um, the countryside. I love mountains. I've always had a bit of an obsession with mountains anyway. And I thought, you know, when I do eventually sort of retire for good or not not retire because i never really see myself retiring because i love what i do but i'd love to end up maybe on the west coast of scotland surrounded by mountains um so for me if i'm going to do anything if i'm going to do a challenge it's got to be an outdoor challenge uh, i'm not a fit person at all i'm not super fit um you know and i have done i have done half marathons i've done like hell runner and stuff like that you know these these crazy runs through like obstacle courses and, and through swamps and stuff um, but that's not really what my enjoyment is. I just like pushing myself as far as I can go. I like the endurance of it and just, you know, it's, it's, it's like a mind over matter thing, isn't it? So you've just got to keep on going and keep on going. So, um, and also if you're doing that in, in beautiful surroundings with beautiful countryside, that really helps. That gives you the, you feeding off that positivity of being out in, in nature and, and all these beautiful views. So, so I'll probably climb somewhere in the region of about 50 different mountains around the world. Mm. Um, done quite a, a lot of 100 mile hikes um from doing them as a, a four-day event to a three-day event and then actually doing it once as a two-day event which is 50 mile a day which is the maximum i've ever gone and that was extremely painful and a real push of um not just i think your mental endurance to be able to carry on putting one foot in front of another um but you know funny enough they, when i did that i did that with two lads who were much, much fitter than me, probably about 20 years younger than me, and, and they actually bailed out the second day. Um, so I don't think it's anything to do with like your fitness. I think it's an a, a ability to just carry on and your determination. Absolutely. Just just pers- perseverance and resilience, yeah. actually, which is which is a topic that came up um, with our last guest, with David Gilbraith, actually talked about resilience. If you, if you could bottle, you know, if you, if you could give, if you could bottle one, um, uh, I don't know. I wouldn't say one, one uh, attribute. Let's say 
and give it to somebody to help them in life, it would be resilience. Um, and, and, uh, and, and, and that seems to hold, hold true in, in what you've just said then. I'd like to talk now just, or in a second about your current business. Uh, I've mentioned a little bit about it, but the, the listeners obviously want to hear it from you, but I'd just like to, uh, again, thank our sponsors for tonight. Uh, our next sponsor for for, uh, for this episode is Alpha Green. Alpha Green is the only online store that exclusively retails the Team Alpha range of combat and fitness equipment, clothing, and merchandise. Coming soon in February 2021, expect only the very best for all levels of athletes, martial artists, fighters, and those pursuing physical development. Online, all time, Alpha Green. Okay, Jeff, can we talk a little bit about your current business that you're running? Uh, I know it's it's very successful. I know you have tens and tens and tens of thousands. You correct me if I'm wrong. It could be a hundred thousand followers on LinkedIn. I know you've re- wrote several books, of which um, I, I I bought. Uh, I, I've purchased one of those books. I, you gave you generously gave me a. A mini book, let's call it, um, on on Facebook marketing, which I then started to actually apply, um, to um to to my Facebook page, um, and and as I mentioned before, um, you perhaps can't say too much, but just to bring up the the, the Shutter app, which you're you're not just an ambassador for, but um, a little bit more than that. So, could you talk to us a little bit about your current business model, please? Yeah, so now I work with uh, photographers in, in, as I say, over twenty different countries around the world and I take them from no matter how long they've been in business so the idea is to to um, make their business the go-to photographer so they become the go-to photographer in their particular niche or, or particular industry so it's all about refining their brand getting their marketing uh, on track and um, creating that premium service so they can uh, which is going to allow them to ultimately change the life and the fact that they can charge maybe three or four times what they're charging now reduce the amount of clients they're working with and be sought after. So they're the type of person who look within their industry, people go, yes, you've got to use this guy. This is, this is the woman to use for this particular type of photography. So they become known, uh, they become liked and they become trusted throughout that particular industry. Um, I love doing it for me. It doesn't actually feel like work. And, and, and you know, the people who come on board my program end up becoming friends more than clients because we speak on the phone a lot. Uh, I also do a lot of work for, all the the big five photography associations, all the professional associations like the British Institute of Professional Photographers and the Society of Wedding and Portrait Photographers. Uh, I've done recently done some work with Canon. Um, I've written for quite a few photography magazines, and I'm also an ambassador for the Female Photographers Association, the British Photography Awards, and the new uh, Shutter app, which is what is called a, a virtual shoot uh, remote app. Please tell us more about the Shutter app. I think that's I think that's going to gain a lot of interest. So uh, the Shutter app is it was developed in Russia, um, a, a combination between a, um, a, a tech guy in Russia and another guy in in Germany. And basically, it's a it's an app that allows photographers to connect with their client's mobile phone camera. Um, so, say for instance, uh, I was wanting. Um, a, a business portrait do and I'm a very busy businessman I don't get a chance to get out or couldn't get down to a studio I can uh, connect with a photographer through the shutter app I can position my phone on a tripod or actually uh, some what some people do is actually put the phone around maybe like a coke can with an elastic band round so that the phone is standing up you know the coke can is, it's a full coke can it's heavy and they can just position that on a desk and then the photographer mm. will take control of the phone through the shutter app and that will allow them to adjust the exposure, to zoom in and out, to um, adjust the lighting compensation. So what that photographer can then do is pause the person, say, oh, move the phone a little bit over here. If you just move that from the background, if you do this, if you get closer to the window light, and can actually create a really professional-looking por- portrait uh, at full resolution. And, and you think some of the, the, you know, like the new Huawei phones have like, uh, and some of the Apple phones have 40, 50 megapixel cameras. So the quality is, is, is fantastic. And what it allows photographers to do is also work with people around the world. So you don't have to just work in your local area. And from, you know, flip it over the other side from people like us in the UK. But, it, you know, if you're a photographer in India or you're a photographer in Africa, it gives you that ability to work with a photographer, with a client in the US or a client in the UK who will probably 
you know, pay you 20, 30 times what you would get charged uh, or be able to get if you worked for one of the clients in your own in your own town or your own city. So is is the app you've told you've told us um, a little bit there about about the app? Is is it available? Is it live now? Can can, can people actually access the app now? And how and if so, yeah, if so, they wanted yeah, to, how so, would they? Yeah, so the app is live now. It's still a free app at the moment, so it's going to go uh, as a paid premium version. So we'll we'll always have that freemium element to it. So you will be able to log on and just download the app and use it freely um, with the limited features and, and limited um, storage. But um, the, the app is at um, theshutter.app, so theshutter.app, and people can just download it. So that the client needs to download the app onto their phone and the photographer needs to log into the shutter.app website and create an account, and he will then control the form through his laptop, through the photographer's portal. Um, but there's a lot of interest in this. It's been used by a lot of photographers. I think it was, was it last week there was over 5,000 um, uh, shoots or uh, pictures taken with the, with the Shutter app. Um, I think there's currently about five or 600 photographers worldwide using it at the wow. moment with a projection to to hopefully get to about 5,000 by by the summer. So it's, it's really, really growing. Now, they're also looking at the other end of things is um, creating a, a, a database for models to be able to go on and then work with photographers all around the world. Mm. Um, so if you're wanting photographs done, you can then de- download the Shutter app and then go eventually go into this, you know, photographer's portal where you can, you can see a photographer's portfolio and then start working with them and doing shoots with them. Uh, obviously, the difference between a studio shoot and uh, you know an in-person shoot and a shutter virtual shoot is a lot cheaper. Um, you still maybe get the same quality and same direction from the t- photographer. It's never going to replace the studio. It's never going to replace an in-person shoot, but it's given it's given that extra dimension, and especially at the moment Option. where places are closed and, and 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 there's restrictions on working face to face with people. It's, it's a really good uh, addition to add to the business and, 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 and pivot your offer in a bit. Yeah, I, I, one, of the, one of the concerns that might come up with that is, and, you know, perhaps people can, add, well, not just anybody, but perhaps, you know, Apple and, and Huawei could access our phones anytime they wanted. But specifically yeah. about this app, you know, this, what securities are in place? So therefore, say, say if, I'm, I'm sure not intentionally, but... You know, photographer. If they is there a way they could even if they accidentally access the client's phone, you know, weeks after the fact. So I imagine is there things in place then to secure so, so in place they, to stop that? So the yeah, so the control is is at the the the, the client's end. So the the control is at the the model's end or the client's end. So when the photographer, uh, when the client downloads the app, the photographer will then send a request to the client. Then the client will have a one-time generated password that will send to the 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 photographer and the photographer has to input that into the portal to actually gain access to that person's um, mobile phone camera control. And obviously they've got access to the, the microphone and speaker system so they can direct and communicate with the model. As soon as that shoot is over, the, the model will just pass the hang up button the same as you will do with me after we've had this Skype conversation. Mm-hmm. And then that's it. The, um, the, the, the communication is cut and terminated. And then if that photographer wants to reestablish that, have to go through the same thing again right. to send access. They would have to send a password. The per- person would have to put the, the next mm. one-time generated password in and redo the whole principle again. So it's totally safe and secure. It's not like, you know, it's just like anything, you like a Zoom or a Skype or a Teams. As soon as you hang up, that's it. Mm. Um, you know, your you, you, you microphone and your you, you camera aren't being seen by the other person. Of course, that's fantastic. Well, I have um, five questions that I like to ask each guest. Um, and with these questions, they're, they're, um, they're time limited. Not officially, I was just saying before, we, we do actually have a, a timer in the corner of the screen. So perhaps one day we're going to officially time these questions. So, um, but, but before I get to those, um, how can any photographer who's out there listening, uh, whether they're wanting to start photography, whether they're an amateur professional photographer, they want to, you know, up their game, so to speak, what's the best way for them to get in touch? Can they just go on Google and type in Jeff Brown Photography Mentor? How would they go about that? Yes, if they go into Google, type in uh, Jeff Brown, the photographer's mentor, or go to the website, thephotographersmentor.com, or if they're on LinkedIn, that's probably one of the best places to contact me because that's where I'm very active 
is uh, just go to LinkedIn and just type in Jeff Brown, the photographer's mentor, and then send me a connection request on LinkedIn. I'll accept you the connection request. And if you have any questions at all, you need a bit of help, just drop me a message. That's that's what I'm here for. And, and they can contact you directly through that, just message you through um, through LinkedIn? Yeah, certainly. Yeah, no problem at all. Fantastic. Well, I'd like to um, put these questions to you. Um, so the first question is, how did you begin your and, and I, I understand some of these were covered, but perhaps yeah. small parts we've missed or to encapsulate it. How did you begin your your entrepreneurial journey? Um, so I think, you know, I think the first of it was actually, I think the, the biggest experience is actually following a passion, you know, so follow the passion with the with the fishing, follow the passion with the, the cooking and the pub, which obviously went the wrong way. But, you know, that, that led to something else, which is now, led to probably one of the most successful businesses I've had, the best quality of life I've, I've had. And, and um, you know, I, I'm probably at, at the happiest I've ever been in my life. What inspired you to continue your business development? I think, um, it, you know, you should always develop, even if it's, if it's not just business, it's, it's personal, you know, reading books, uh, downloading podcasts, listening to audio books, you, we're always learning. You don't just leave school at like, you know, 17 or, or whatever, or, or even leave university and college. I think that's just the, you know, that's just the start of your life. We've got so much more to experience. And I think at the age of 50, I finally discovered what, what it means to be happy and, and, and means not to be stressed out. And it's not all about financial gains. It's not about the clothes you wear or where you go on holiday. You know, you can be happy and happiness is a state of mind. Happiness, you can be happy anytime, whatever happens. And also the ability to deal with stress. You know, I can't remember the last time I raised my voice. I can't remember the last time I really got stressed about anything. You turn back five, five or six years ago, put me in the pub, you know, five or six years ago, it was a t- different ball game. So I think, you know, we always continually learn. And so, you know, what am I going to be like in another 10 years time? How, you know, it, you just always add into it. And it, all these experiences, you you know, are there are meant to be there and, and for me to pass down to my daughter. So hopefully she might get to this stage at the age of 30 instead of, you know, it took me to the age mm. of 50 to get to where I'm, I feel sort of comfortable. Could you tell us a little bit more about your personal psychology or feeling towards pursuing a top contract or client or business venture? I think um, with any business venture, with any client, uh, with any contract, it's now, definitely now, more than ever, um, it's all about personality. You know, people buy from people they know, like, and trust. And I think you have to have that genuine connection with people, uh, people who are, you know, uh, people who are influencers, people who gain a lot of followers, are followed because they're a personality. They're not a logo. They're not a brand. You know, they are their own actual brand. And... I think be genuine, you know, don't, don't try and be somebody you're not. And if you yourself and you give value, if you give freely, good things are going to come to you. And I do a lot of that. I give so many free talks. I give so much information away for free. And in return, people see that um, and that converts people to, to clients and that way more opportunities come. For a person out there looking to begin their own business, what would you recommend they do to be, to begin this pursuit? Um, I would say one of the things, one of the biggest things, um, obviously investigate your market, know who your ideal client is. So you don't want to become, you don't want to be the, become the cheapest. Um, you know, be what you want to do is, is is serve, find your ideal client, serve that client really well, differentiate yourself from everybody else, have something that makes you stand out. Don't worry too much about the competition. Don't look at the people around you and think, oh, that guy's charging 100 quid less than me, so I'm going to reduce my prices so I'm cheaper than him because that's not going to make you any money. That's going to stress you out and it's not going to lead to a good end. What you want to be looking at is not looking at your competition, looking at the people who you want to be. So whatever business you're in, you know, there's people out there who are the go-to people in that particular business. And there'll be one of those in your local city, your local state or, or county, There'll be one of those, you know, or quite a few of those in your country. So look at the the the, the best, whatever, you know, photographer, um, personal personal trainer in your local 
um, county or in your local state, look at the the best ones in in England or in America or wherever, and see what those people are doing, see what their branding's about, see what their message is about. Uh, because you know, years ago they started off doing their first jobs for free. They started off in exactly the same position as you, and it's their dedication, their passion, and their brand, and what they're putting out there that's got them to where they are. That they can charge five or ten times more than everybody else. Life is absolutely a challenge, but it needs to be. What has it taught you so far? That um, even in even in the the darkest um, the darkest times, even when you think you know, that the, there's nothing good can come of this and you can't see your way out. Um, nothing lasts forever. You know, obviously life doesn't last forever, but the bad times don't last forever. The good times don't last forever either. You know, the, the life is up and down roller coaster, but um, there is a way out. And, and sometimes things happen for a reason. And then you can look back and say, you know what, I'm so pleased that happened. I'm so pleased that bit of crap happened. I'm so pleased that I ended up in that situation because if I hadn't, I wouldn't have been where I am now, you know, and people, you know, you can put that down to anything. It doesn't happen to be to business. You can put that down to personal relationships. You know, you come out of a relationship, you're really upset, but then, you know, if you hadn't finished with that person, that wouldn't have led you to go to the bar on this particular night and meet this other person. And then this is the love of your life. So yeah, things happen for a reason and the bad stuff doesn't last forever. That's the perfect way to end it. Jeff, Thank you so much for your time tonight. It's it's been a, a very very informative podcast, and you know, and and what we've talked about can be applied, I think, to to pr pretty much any pursuit that somebody wants to follow. And that's really what this podcast is about. It's um, you know, it's it's specific areas, but areas that then can open up into 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 development and in, in, in many others. Um. Before before we uh, before we end the podcast, is there anybody that you want to thank, or anything else that you would like to add, um, or, or or anything that you would like to mention? I just just like to thank you for um, giving me the opportunity to come on and and, and talk to everybody. I, I love giving podcasts. I love uh, giving you know help and advice out to people and sharing experiences because that's what the world's about, isn't it? And you know, there's you know, no matter where you are in life, there's always somebody who's been through it before you, and then if they can give the next person down that bit of um bit of advice that's make, gonna make their journey a little bit easier then then brilliantly and hopefully in return that other person will carry on doing it and that, that cycle will go around fantastic jeff thank you so much for your time and um, we didn't mention the secret mission to north korea but perhaps it's best we left that one <laughs> <laughs> i've seen the photos it did happen um and uh yeah and I, again i want to thank you so much for such a such a such a great uh a great hour of your time uh it, it was it was lovely to have you on and uh and i just hope you have a great weekend and uh, no doubt i will speak to you and, and see you soon and again thank you very much for your uh your very valuable time no problem it's been an absolute pleasure thanks very much james take care jeff thank you take care bye now bye bye